This is the Homestead Journey Podcast, the podcast dedicated to the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. This is episode number 47 of the Homestead Journey Podcast. Welcome, everyone. Thank you once again for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us here on the Homestead Journey. My name is Brian Wells. I am coming to you from 3B Farm and Homestead here in beautiful upstate New York. It has been another great week here on the Homestead. And so let's jump right into this week's Homestead Happenings. This week's Homestead Happening segment is going to be a little bit on the short side because our Charting the Course segment is rather long. It's a an interview this week with Jack and Jackie from the Mindful Homestead, so I really want to get to that. But I didn't want to skip over the Homestead Happening segment because we did get a lot of things done here on the Homestead this week. Number one, I actually made some spaghetti sauce, some red sauce that I actually like. Uh, I am not someone who really enjoys red sauce. I used to, but lately I just haven't. But uh, I tried a recipe out of my ball canning book that I really, really enjoyed. And so my wife actually made some lasagna. Her parents are up visiting for the weekend, for the holiday weekend. And usually when her dad comes up, she'll always make lasagna for him. And I suffer through it because I really don't like lasagna, but I try to be a team player and take one for the team because I like my (laughs) father-in-law. But this week, she made that lasagna with the sauce that I made. And folks, I absolutely loved it. Even my son commented on how good that sauce was. So hopefully this coming week, I'll be making another batch of that. But our tomatoes are starting to wind down as is... Well, the garden in general, uh, probably here in another 10 days or two weeks, we'll start getting frost warnings, and then that will be that, at least with the summer garden. And quite frankly, I did not get a fall garden in this year like I wanted to. I didn't do as much succession planning this year as I wanted to. It is what it is. The mama that I picked up in Vermont and brought back to the farm is doing well, as are her piglets. For a little bit, it seemed like she was having a little bit of diarrhea, but I think it was just a feed change. She had been, well, being fed a lot of goat's milk and a little bit of sow feed, and then I switched her straight over to a regular corn-based, locally milled hog feed. And so I think that kind of upset her stomach a little bit, but she seems to be back on her feed now and the piglets seem to be doing well. It's just so much fun to watch them run around and it's not something that I get to enjoy a lot because many times when we have the piglets, it's in the early spring and so they're not out enjoying the sun as much as they would at this time of the year. And so watching them out running around, sleeping in the sun, has just really been a highlight for me this week and uh, just really, really an enjoyable time. As I mentioned, my in-laws are up visiting from Pennsylvania. My father-in-law is actually a meat cutter by trade, and so when he comes up, I try to get him to bring up some bulk meat with him periodically so that we can can it. And so we did that this weekend. We canned up 31 pints of beef, and if you follow us at all on Instagram, uh, if you don't, why not? (laughs) But on Instagram or Facebook, Um, I do share pictures periodically throughout the week, so if you haven't already, give us a like or a follow uh, on Facebook and Instagram. The links to all of our social media accounts are in the show notes, Uh, but we did go ahead and do that yesterday, and so very excited. We did that uh, probably early spring, I think it was, they came up and visited. It was before the COVID thing happened. And we burnt through that beef so quickly. In fact, my goal was to actually have him bring up twice as much as what he brought up last year and or last time. And I guess I didn't communicate that to him correctly. He brought up the same amount as what we did last time. And so hopefully it will be enough to tide us over until he comes up again with some more meat. Or I could just go to my local butcher shop or my local um, meat store 
and get some beef to can up. But anyhow, so we did that this week. Very, very exciting. The last thing I wanted to share with you is that today we had some smoked chicken. Chicken that we raised ourselves. And then I borrowed my dad's smoker and we smoked two of those chickens for lunch today. And folks, it was delicious. And the other thing that was really, really satisfying is I looked around that table. On that table, almost everything that we enjoyed today came from our homestead. The only thing that didn't were the mashed potatoes and we did cheat and buy some gravy. Okay, please don't hold it against us. But when you're smoking a chicken, it doesn't lend itself well to making gravy anyhow. And we are out of my broth. So we went ahead and bought gravy. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to disappoint you. But other than that, <laughs> everything else, all of the vegetables, the chicken, it all came from our homestead, and it was so good. The beans were as fresh as you can get beans. We picked them, and they went almost immediately into the pot. We had roasted beets. We had summer squash, all of that freshly pulled out of the garden and into the pan. It was absolutely delicious, but more than that, it was so very satisfying, and it just reminded me again in part, why we do what we do here on 3B Farm and Homestead. Well, that's it for this week's Homestead Happenings. Let's jump on over to this week's Charting the Course. On today's episode, I am so excited to be joined by Jack and Jackie from the Mindful Homestead. The Mindful Homestead YouTube channel and mindfulhomestead.com you're definitely going to want to check them out on YouTube and check out their website as well. But don't do that until after you've heard this interview with them, okay? <laughs> this was an absolute blast. I enjoyed chatting with them. Time flew by, so this interview is a little bit long, but I really do think, and well, maybe it's just me being self-serving, but I do think it's well worth it. It really is. Uh, it was just an enjoyable conversation with them with regards to what they're doing and some big life changes that they've made here recently and kind of the thought that went into that, the mindfulness that went into that. So without further ado, Jack and Jackie, welcome to the Homestead Journey podcast. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Now, this is something that actually, to kind of give people a little bit, a bit of a backstory to this, uh, I was supposed to come over to... New Hampshire back in, was it March now? It, it, it seems like so long ago and yet it seems like it was yesterday. Yeah, that was March because it, uh, it was to be a Father's Day present for me. When we were going to attend a charcuterie class together and uh, my hope had been for us to be able to sit down and have this conversation in, in person. And uh, obviously COVID had different plans for us. So here we are now and... Um, so why don't we start with a bit of an introduction. Um, tell me a little bit about who you are and where you're at. Uh, so my name is Jack. Um, my wife, Jackie, is with me. We, uh, we live on 10 and a half acres here in the beautiful Monadnock region of southwestern New Hampshire um, that we bought in 2016 as a, a, a house for us, for us and our, our soon-to-be-growing family. And now you bought the house in 2016, 10 acres. At that point, were you planning on homesteading with it or kind of you, you bought it, but you weren't quite, you know, kind of what was your, your, your perspective at that point? I think it depends on who you ask. I would say I was fairly clueless. Um, when we were looking for houses, Jack's one requirement was that he wanted acreage. Um, so I don't think in all my years of being with Jack, 15 years this year, that I thought we were going to end up doing this, um, but I wouldn't change it, change it for anything. So I think if we asked Jack what the idea was, it would probably be something a little different. It had always been in the back of my head. My parents were, uh, they live in New Jersey now, but they were always kind of hippies. And at one point I was living way up North. I was kind of ski bumming in a resort town and my mom had gotten me a subscription to Mother Earth News. And I think it was a little bit kind of a vicarious thing. She wanted to put the seed in my head. 
And from there, you know, I was always interested in hunting. And when the time came for us to purchase a house, I was looking for something where kind of in the back of my head, the homesteading thing wasn't hundred percent yet, but I knew I wanted at least to live a more out there in the country lifestyle than I had been living previously. And, and so from that, I, I'm kind of taking away that neither one of you really grew up as in, in kind of the homesteading lifestyle? No, not at all. I grew up in New Jersey, uh, the western part of the state, so not necessarily, you know, parking lots and pavement like a lot of people think most of New Jersey is. But I grew up in, you know, an area where mom had a garden, but we bought most of our food from the store. They both worked full-time jobs. The gardening was more of a hobby for them than anything else. And the idea of raising animals for food to, the, to them was very foreign. Yeah, and I, I grew up here in New Hampshire um, in like central part of the state. However, my parents weren't really into it either, not raising animals. Um, I grew up around like farm life uh, with having a lot of family up in Vermont. So I was accustomed to, to parts of it, but again, never, never to this scale where we're at now. Interesting. And so you, you bought this 10 acres. Um, you, at what point did you kind of think, okay, maybe we want to want to try something? you know, and kind of what was the gateway, I guess, into this lifestyle for you? I guess the, we knew we wanted a garden when we moved up here and the property that we bought, it had a garden out back in the backyard, but it was in kind of a, it was in a really bad spot as far as shade went. It was kind of sunken in, it was sitting in a low lying area and it was very wet. The soil wasn't that great. It hadn't been tended to in a few years. And we made the call one year to bring in a couple dump truck loads full of fill to essentially bring, raise that area up almost two and a half feet so we could have a, a much better garden and build some raised beds there and, and make a go of, of growing a, you know, a legitimate amount of food versus just kind of the, the odd zucchini or tomato or something like that. And I think once we made the call to like start bringing in dump trucks of dirt, specifically for a garden that was kind of like oh maybe it's not such a big deal to get a couple chickens and you know i think that was we kind of snuck i snuck those chickens in on you i think <laughs> yeah i think i agree i think it started with the desire for gardening because i am very very into gardening more so it was always house plants and flowers and then moving here gave me the opportunity to do some vegetable gardening which i love and, and then honestly, I mean, we, we found out we were pregnant with Emma and we went into a local Agway store and I saw a bunch of little chicks and I wanted some and here that was we it. Are. Yeah, it started with four, I think it was four chicks. But yeah, four chicks. Yeah, it was two silver Wyandots and two, uh, uh, were they Andalusians? Yes. Yeah, two, Andal two Spanish Andalusians. And uh, that was it. Four chickens kind of started it and I think at that point we just decided since we knew we had Emma on the way, we wanted to get more into the lifestyle we, where we knew where our food was coming from and we knew what was going into it because we were going to eventually be feeding it to her. And so you've got mother earth news that's kind of giving you information um, and, and kind of helping you along. Um, were there any other kind of, is there any, any local, you know, homesteading community there, or was it more through online kind of connections that you started kind of getting, I guess, more information about how to, how to do it? Yeah, there were some, we had started watching some YouTube videos just to kind of, it kind of started like, if I wanted to learn something for the garden, um, we saw, we suffer from blight around here. It's a big deal. And you know, I think I had gone on YouTube and I had started trying to find some videos on how to deal with tomato blight. And that led me down the path of the YouTube homesteader. Um, and I saw people like, you know, Aust down at Homesteady. He was still in Connecticut at the time. And then Al up at Lumna Acres in Northern New Hampshire, which was pretty cool. I, I saw that other people were doing it and that didn't necessarily push us into YouTube at that point, but it, it it kind of furthered the idea that, hey, this is something we can actually do. It's, it's not as 
mind blowing as I thought it was to, to try and produce as much food as we could right here. As far as locally, do you have any kind of homesteading community? It's one of the things I, you know, I watch, uh, you know, a number of YouTubers. I follow a number of YouTubers, and and it seems like down in in the North Carolina area in particular, there's you know kind of this huge community of of homesteaders. Um, where I'm at it's not, there are people that are doing it, but it's not, it's just not the same as, as far as at least what I see uh, as, as the community that they describe down there. What do you have in your area? We're kind of lucky to have, so I'm going to throw it to the motto of our state, which is live free or die. Um, we have a pretty strong community of, of people that are very invested in, in doing things themselves. Um, and I wouldn't necessarily say it goes so far into the homesteading realm. There's a lot of people that are, that are growing their own food and they're not necessarily calling it homesteading, but in the area where we are virtually and everybody has a garden and chickens. chickens. I think that's what helped us get into chickens is we moved to this road and just about everybody has chickens and, and, um, Two neighbors that we became close with had a lot of chickens yeah and that's how i got introduced to being around the birds because i never liked birds they always just freaked me out um and so again just another gateway in and then we ended up doing meat birds with them and and so i, I guess there is somewhat of a local homesteading ish but i would say that the people don't call themselves homesteaders this, this is just kind of what they do yeah it's almost more of like a diy food culture than it is necessarily homesteading if that makes sense no it, it makes total sense to me because really that's how i grew up um i grew up and and i think many people would have considered us to be homesteaders at, at different points in our lives but in particular my grandparents um, and several aunts and uncles, but we never used that term. To us, it was just living. You know, it, it wasn't until I discovered the the YouTube community online that I really put a name to what it was that we had been doing all along, if that makes any sense. It was, you know, so so for us, it was just living. Yeah, and it makes perfect sense. I think for us, it was very similar in that, you know, we kind of needed a name to describe what we were doing to our friends back in New Jersey. And, you know, Jackie has a lot of family in New York state where her family's originally from um, out on Long Island. And I think calling it homesteading at first, you know, we were very naive in terms of having a small garden and some chickens, but we kind of just slapped the label of homesteading on it and sort of grew into it more than, you know, we maybe even anticipated at first. No, that that makes total sense, and I think, again, you know, the 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 name of this podcast is the Homestead Journey. So I, I'm very much interested in kind of how people kind of are progressing and taking those next steps, and and obviously you've got to start somewhere, um, and and then as you progress, I think homesteading is such a big tent. There's just so many different ways that you can go with it. I guess for me, and I don't know where it came from, but. I, I kind of had a, a bad perception of what homesteading was as, you know, maybe 10 or 15 years ago. Um, and my mom was really the first one that started using the term homesteader uh, to describe what they were doing. And when she, when she would use that term, I kind of would roll my eyes. Um, and I don't know why it is. It's kind of funny thinking back on it now. But for some reason, I just kind of had this... I don't know, just this really poor concept of what it was. Well, so many people harken back to, like when they hear homesteading, they think Little House on the Prairie, where, you know, it, it involves this lifestyle of like living without electricity and, you know, essentially not necessarily living in squalor, but living a life that, you know, you, home, you homestead because you have to versus because you want to. Mm -hmm. And I think there's, there is with some people a negative connotation of the word because they assume, well, if you're homesteading and you're growing your own food, it's because you can't go to the store to buy food or you can't afford it. And I think today's homesteader is really changing that perception. You know, it, it's a better food than you can get at the grocery store. Um, so I can totally see where there's, you know, that as when you were younger, there was that built in 
kind of almost, I don't want to say stigma, but I guess that's the word you would use to describe. I, I think that's a great, that's a great word to use with what I kind of associated homesteading with. It was, you know, kind of the, you know, the, you, you bathe once a month, whether you need it or not, you, you yep. know, just, just not, not a, not a positive image. Uh, and, and that's one of the things that I'm really appreciative of, you know, the, the, those who are doing the YouTube thing, um, that there is, uh, I guess, a, a, a better face being put on that moniker. And, and maybe nobody else had that, that perception of homesteading. Um, maybe it was just me. Maybe I'm just twisted. I don't know. Um, but uh, I mean, it, I still only take a shower once a month. I don't know what you're talking about. This <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, what you guys do over there in New Hampshire? You know, you 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 guys do things a little different over there. Yeah, that reminds me. I got to get out the wash tub. I think uh, this weekend I might go for it. <laughs> Final date. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, going back to what you mentioned with regards to you know the little house on the prairie, it is very funny to me how many people do have that perception of, of homesteading, that that's what homesteading is all about. And, you know, in fact, when people pop in and they're new to the homesteading groups, many times, one of the first questions is, okay, how can I get some of that free homesteading land? Yep. And uh, that, that obviously is a thing of the past. Yeah. How great would it be though, if it was still available? I would, hey, sign me up, sign me up. Um, you know, in, I, I don't know what land goes for where you're at, but uh, it's it's not cheap where I'm at. And with the current situation, it's, you know, the price seems to be going up and up. So if I could find some free land, if anybody knows of free land, let Jack and I know. We'd love to know. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's been pretty interesting. It, the most, so we have the YouTube channel and Instagram and all that stuff, and we can talk about it later if you want. But people have reached out to us via those channels and the first question I get all the time is about chickens. Like people want to know more about chickens and you know, all that stuff. But the second most asked question I get is, Hey, we're thinking of moving to New Hampshire. You know, where should I look? What towns should I look at? What towns are homesteading friendly? And it really says something to the fact that there's a lot of people out there, especially in this day and age that are interested in, in what the sort of thing that we're doing and they're willing to make a substantial financial commitment. I mean, the people that are asking me when I, usually my first question is what's your budget and their financial uh, commitment, I guess, is, is more than, more than we made. So. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, obviously given the current climate with regards to the whole COVID thing, I think that um, has certainly accelerated it, but even before COVID hit, I was seeing, um, an increased interest in in this lifestyle because I think a lot of people were starting to recognize that you know our, our food systems are broken. Um, we're, we've become so disconnected from from our food uh, that we don't value it anymore. Um, and there was just I think a, maybe a romantic notion that I think sometimes was maybe a little bit overblown. Um, sometimes people look at Instagram and they see the the pretty pictures and they don't see the, the mud and the poop and all the kind of stuff that goes along with it. But uh, I was already seeing that before, before COVID. I think that's just kind of accelerated it. And so it is, it's something to me that I think I'm hoping that this isn't just a response that people are having to a pandemic, but that these will really be meaningful shifts in the way people live their lives. Yeah. I think when COVID hit, it was very interesting to watch our friends and family flock to us, right? I mean, yeah. in terms of food, um, you know, in March and April and May, it was, it was, I don't know, it was a really interesting feeling of feeling, I guess, secure in that we had what we needed if everything kept going the way that we thought the world was going to go. But the amount of people that came to us for eggs and, and meats and, and our just, pork shares yeah yeah it was it was intense and i i certainly was not into this whole thing in the first place and um i think a lot of it was stigma and just totally different than how everybody that i know lives their life but then to see this complete shift during covid um it was very interesting 
And I definitely think that, uh, you know, back when it, you know, it first happened, you know, kind of the running joke was um, not, now maybe the preppers aren't the crazy ones or mm -hmm. they're, they're not quite so crazy after all. Uh, but you know, it was very interesting to me, the number of people that, you know, said to me, well, Brian, out of all the people I know, you're the one that I'm least worried about uh, being able to survive something like this. And so I think there is a sense to where, because of, you know, what, what we've been through the last several months, certainly if there was a stigma to the, to homesteading, uh, I, I think there's a, um, a lot more people view it in a positive light. Uh, than they, they may have six six or eight months ago. Yeah, I, I think a lot of it, I mean, we sell eggs locally and for a long time, you know, getting somebody to pay $3 for farm fresh eggs was not like pulling teeth, but it was definitely, it took a little convincing and you knew that a lot of people would rather just go to the store and pay $1.50 for a dozen eggs. But to start getting the messages on Facebook and in our email when all of a sudden, nobody knew if the eggs were going to be at the grocery store. You know, we had people that had never purchased eggs before that were coming and buying three dozen every weekend from us. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're listening to this podcast and you're that type of person, one of those people, we love you. Thank you for purchasing yeah. eggs. It definitely helps out. But, uh, but it was just funny to see, you know, how that went. And then some of those same people who were buying eggs from us actually turned around and bought chickens. Yeah, and they used us as a resource to help coach them and now they're getting their first eggs and they sent me a text like oh my gosh we got our first egg and it was it was really fun because we got to really coach them but also get to see them every week when they would pick up the three dozen eggs and now they don't buy from us anymore but it's that's okay it's a cool thing to know that we were able to pass it on which is something that Jack and I are really into is is education and helping people learn and understand to be able to do something on their own. Yeah, we, we experienced the exact same thing with regards to our egg sales. I mean, there for a while, I, I couldn't keep eggs in my egg box. Uh, I mean, it was, it was pointless. We had so many people, you know, that were um, buying them, like you said, three, four, you know, six dozen at a time. And, you know, I think we, we've started to see that wane as well as people have bought chickens and you have more people, maybe they didn't buy chickens, but other people that they know, uh, have chickens and and there's more eggs being produced, but there certainly was a great feeling of satisfaction to me that I, and and maybe I'm I'm way overthinking this, but I, I really felt like I was helping people live. I was and not even just live. I was helping people survive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's totally cool too. Like you know, in our heads, we have never had visions of grandeur that we're gonna like buy a mansion on on the mindful homestead egg sales. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it's just you know, you go into it and, you know, maybe you have an inkling here and there like, oh, it's going to be great. I'm going to pay for my chickens just by selling eggs. And, and that never is the case. Usually never anybody out there listening, they, you know, selling eggs, you could sell every egg your chickens lay and you're still not going to pay for the feed that they eat. Exactly. But, you know, the ability to, to kind of coach these people through it and talk to people and, and watch them become more independent in their food supply for themselves, you know, that's better than any $3 dozen set of eggs that I could sell. You know, Absolutely. Yeah. That, that's such a great point that again, that sense of, um, you know, where, where we're helping people live a life that's more self-sufficient, more self-reliant um, is, you know, I, I 100% concur with both of you that that is a, a very satisfying feeling that we're passing on some of these um skills and, and, and knowledge that if it weren't for us doing this, a lot of that would be lost. Yeah. And there's definitely a little bit of a rebel attitude in there too. Like you feel like you're kind of sticking it to the man. Like <laughs> every time I walk by the eggs in the grocery store, cause we do still go to the grocery store, you know, spoiler alert there for anybody. Who thinks <laughs> we're totally self uh, we do still go to the grocery store, but it's cool to like walk by the eggs in the grocery store and kind of be like, Psh, I don't need those. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Same way walking by the chicken, like, yeah, I've got better chicken than that in my freezer yeah. at home. Yeah. Or even to walk by, like, you know, the, there's not a Whole Foods near us, so I can't even, like, use that as a reference. But to walk by, like, in our local grocery store, the humanely raised, pastured, free-range, non-GMO, non-antibiotic chicken that's selling for, like, $14 a pound. Yep. And be like, we've got 60 broilers outside right now that are on grass eating bugs and crickets. And, you know, it's going to 
in a month, we're going to have chicken that's even better than that for way less. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and beyond that, you know, it's not even so much even the, 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 the monetary thing, but it's when you sit down to a meal of, of food that you have raised, to me, there's no greater sense of satisfaction when you look at that plate and, you know, 70, 80% of that, that plate is, is, you know, stuff that you've had a direct hand in producing. There is just a sense of satisfaction that's unparalleled. Yeah, I think our our commentary at most meals is how much of this plate is from the homestead. And some yeah. nights we get darn near close to everything, um, which is incredibly satisfying. Yeah, it's a little bit, I have a slightly morbid streak in me when it comes to eating food. But every once in a while, like I always, I look down at the plate and I think to myself, like, I feel good that I was able to, if I'm eating a protein, I feel good that I was able to look this animal in the eye and know the life it lived before I ate it. Um, and I think for, for a pretty good while now, you know, we've been able to say that about most proteins, even fish. I mean, it, homesteading goes well beyond just raising stuff at home. But if we go on vacation to Key West, we have friends down there and we go visit, I try to make it a point to get out on a couple fishing boats and bring something home from that trip. So even the, the fish that we're eating, is you know sustainably sourced yeah and and i mean it goes to you know even into the areas of, although i'm not a big hunter before we started recording you and i were talking about bear season getting ready to start there in new hampshire i haven't hunted here in in new york for 10 years um but you know there, there's certainly an aspect of of that i think in fact you guys sell a shirt in your store that um has something to do with the, the original grass-fed meat or something like that? How, what is the original free-range organic meat. There it is. The yeah. original free-range organic meat. Absolutely. It's, it's really cool. I'm going to say it, it's a cool set of, it's a set of antlers and then it looks like a skull with the text and definitely go check it out. I'm sure Brian will throw a link in the, in the comments or something or the show notes or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. You we definitely want to check it out, but it's uh, yeah, it's, it's great. But yeah, so definitely um, I 100% agree that, uh, you know, homesteading definitely goes beyond even just what you raise and grow yourself, but it can, you know, it, it can go into foraging. Um, you know, there are a lot of people that are into foraging mushrooms and foraging, you know, wild garlic. And, and, and I wish I, I was better at that. that. That's a skill I really want to learn. Um, but then even into, you know, hunting and fishing, um, all of those things I think can be a part of homesteading. And that's what I think is so awesome about the lifestyle is that it can go in a whole bunch of different directions. And, you know, I think a lot of people have in their minds, this preconceived notion that in order to be a homesteader, you've got to be on 5, 10, 15, 20 acres of land. And, and you certainly can be, but I think you can be a homesteader and be on a much smaller um, piece of property and, and be doing a lot of things. It's exactly like you said, like it comes down to doing what you can. Um, it, you know, with the whole hunting thing, it's funny, there's a video up on our YouTube channel where I, I talk about, and somebody had just commented on it recently and I rewatched it, it's from earlier this spring. But in the video I comment where I kind of bring a bunch of it together where I say, you know, there's, there's gardening, there's raising animals, there's foraging, there's bushcrafting. There's all these things that in and of themselves, you know, there's hunting and fishing. All these things, if you look at them separately, they're hobbies. Like gardening can be a hobby and hunting can be a hobby and fishing can be a hobby and bushcrafting can be a hobby. But if you tie them all together, they almost all come together to make up what could be considered homesteading. Or if you want to get outside the term homesteading, just to build a much more sustainable life. Um, you know, you can hunt and fish and garden and still very much live a sustainable lifestyle without necessarily raising your own chickens or pigs or anything like that. Yeah, and, and that, that's absolutely a great point. And, and sometimes for some people, they don't have the ability to, you know, they don't have the land to, mm -hmm. to be able to raise their own protein. Um, or maybe not the protein they'd like, but maybe if they can't raise chickens, they could raise quail or they, they could raise rabbits. So I, again, it goes back to just what you said, where, you know, do what you can do as much as you can. You'll be surprised. There's people raising quail and aquariums in their living rooms in the city. Yeah. Which I don't know how smelly that would get. I've never <laughs> raised quail, but 
you know, if you have a balcony on your porch and you live on, you know, the 10th story in Manhattan, it would be very easy to set up a little crate out there and do quail. I mean, you can get quail eggs at eight weeks. They're, they're ready for butchering at eight weeks. It's, it's very possible to do everything. Yeah, it, it is. And, you know, I, you, you, you talking about the, uh, the aquarium in the middle of it. I, I saw a guy in a homesteading group who was doing exactly that, raising quail in the middle of his room, middle of his living room in an aquarium. And uh, he posted a picture of an omelet that he made with his quail eggs. Uh, to me, that was awesome that somebody had that level of commitment because, and, and I don't know if he was married or not, or, or what his situation was. So um, my wife would not be okay with quail in the living room. I don't know, Jackie, would you be good with that? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> so the line's got to be drawn somewhere. Yes, uh, <laughs> but, you know, the fact that um, people have that, you know, the, the willingness to do that, um, I think is awesome. And, and again, all of us can do something. For sure. So we've kind of, you know, talked about a lot of stuff here up to this point, but let me just ask you a, a more point, pointedly, it, you know, you, you're raising, you've got a garden, you're raising chickens, you're doing meat birds right now. Um, and you also do pastured po uh, pork, correct? Yes. Yeah. We have six pigs out back right now. And is there anything else that I missed or is that uh, we have a little bit. I mean, so we have the garden. I don't know if you would rope kind of fruit trees and, and yeah. other kind of bushes and shrubs that are edibles in there with that. Um, I do very light duty foraging. Um, for me, you know, oysters, chanterelles and uh, morels are about as far as I go down that rabbit hole. Um, and recently, kind of this year, I mean, don't call us COVID Carl, but we got into canning as a uh, as a way to preserve kind of what we're doing on the homestead and make it last longer yeah that that's something that's been fun to watch on your channel as you've been doing some of that um that's something that you know i, I is very near and dear to my heart yeah not to inflate your ego too much but you were a big step in that for me well i i, I appreciate that i'm i i'm glad to hear that um and keep doing it I, it's to me that and I think you 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 kind of hinted at, at it in your post on Instagram today. I, it, did your canning video come out yet? You, you had another one coming out. I can't remember if it did or not. We had a canning video. You you did was, one with the. I think it was the dilly beans. Did you did the dilly yeah, beans. The canning video with dilly dilly beans. Yes. Right, but you you put up. I think it was a picture on Instagram of some stuff you'd canned, and we're kind of hinting at that you had another video coming out. Oh, it's not, it's not about canning. It was just kind of like, Hey, here's a video of canning stuff to uh, ah, okay. I do over until the video comes out. But, but one of the things that you, you, uh, you, you said in there was that it helps extend the harvest. Yes. And now what you're going to be able to do is enjoy that harvest in the middle of winter. And so to me, again, it's taking that sense of satisfaction and just really helping you feel that all year long. And to me, that's awesome. And it's really kind of opened us up into areas where we haven't ever even, we're utilizing things that we never even thought to use before. Um, you had mentioned that you did corn cob jelly recently and that you really liked it. We had done, we had used dandelions earlier this year. Oh yeah, the dandelion jelly. Yeah. And I didn't know if we were going to like it. And yeah, it's delicious. It, it kind of tastes like chamomile. Yeah, we, we, we made this dandelion jelly and I, I looked at it and I was like, there's no way this is going to possibly be good. As I was sitting there going through probably three pounds of dandelion heads and cleaning them and getting them ready to make this tea. Yeah. And it ended up, you know, making a, a bunch of pints of dandelion jelly. And it's, it's really good. It's probably one of my favorites. You know, the funny thing is, is I started, my son went out and spent, I can't remember how long picking dandelions for me. Cause I was, you know, I'd seen it. I saw everybody making dandelion jelly and I sat down and I snipped about three dandelions. And I said, I, this is too fiddly. I, you know, <laughs> I am going to stab myself in the eyeball with a dull pencil. This is driving me nuts. <laughs> so I, I just threw all the dandelions after my son had spent probably an hour out there picking dandelions in the hot sun. And I threw him the chicken. I cannot do this. Well, um, so kudos to you for sticking by because I just I said there's no way I will say it wasn't without disappointment because our batch ended up not setting up as well as we would have liked so it's a little bit runny and and you know it's nice and clear it looks great in the in the jars but you know 
the first one that I opened afterwards when I was like, oh, it's, it's not set. It, it was a little disappointing, but it still tastes great. Uh, just call it dandelion syrup. There we go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, I did go on to make lilac jelly, and that wasn't quite as fiddly to me. And, uh, and that was the first time I'd ever done any kind of floral jelly. And I really, really liked it. To me, it reminded me somewhat of honey with a bit of a tang to it, if that makes I, any sense. I saw your post on it, or you talked about it maybe in a podcast. And I started eyeing Jackie's dandelion bush, or not dandelion, lilac, lilac bush outside. And what did you say? I said no, because it was finally getting good blooms this year, but maybe next year. Maybe next year. <laughs> so this year... Lilac jelly didn't happen, but possibly next year. Well, the good thing for me is we have a friend um, that just lives probably a quarter of a mile down the road from us, and she has uh, probably 10 really good size uh, lilac trees in her backyard. And, uh, and so she was more than happy to supply me with all the lilacs that I wanted. And the funny thing was, is I got down there and I started I didn't know anything about, I mean, I, I know what a lilac looks like, but I didn't realize that there were so many different varieties uh, yeah. of, of lilacs till I get down there. And she was like, oh, the ones down at the other end, you may be more interested in them because they're more fragrant. So I went down and I cut some of the fragrant ones and, uh, and brought them home. And then I realized that the fragrant ones had smaller blossoms. So they were a lot more fiddly. <laughs> <laughs> to take apart the, the ones that weren't quite so fragrant. So the next batch I made, I said, forget the fragrant ones. I'm going with the bigger blossoms. Well, it's the state flower here in New Hampshire. So we yeah. take a lot of pride in our lilacs. Um, I did not know that's cool. That's cool. So then you, then you could really, you know, take that to the next level, you know, the, the you know, as, your, as, as part of your marketing. Yeah, you find them on the, actually, I mean, they're everywhere because they are the state flower. You can find them on the side of the road. Yeah, I'm sure even if Jackie doesn't let me cut her lilac bush next year, I could find a few people just My random. mom's, you could. I could. <laughs> I would have no problem cutting Jackie's mother's lilac bushes up. There you go. There you go. So you're, you're into the whole canning thing now. So right now, are you pressure canning? Are you hot water bath? I, I, know, I know you've been hot water bath canning. Do you have a pressure canner? Are you heading that direction or? Don't have a pressure canner yet. You've got me lusting after an All-American. They, they are nice. They are nice. Yep. I've, I've been eyeing their website. I know they're out of stock right now, um, but for next year, I think we may be making that investment. And you know, the funny thing is I, I, I canned for well, a lot of years up until last year. Um, I had always canned with my grandparents. Uh, they have, I think it's a Miro uh, canner that they bought, I think when my dad was one or two. So, I mean, it was in the, er it was in the early fifties when they bought this canner and, uh, and it still works fine, but it's one that has a gasket and it takes, you know, it takes a while for it to get up the pressure. And then it takes a while for the, you know, the pressure to, to release. So the cycles are really long with it. And uh, I bought um, the smaller All-American at the end of the season last year, it has just been a game changer for me as far as how quickly you can cycle through uh, a canning run with that versus my grandparents' uh, canner. So um, definitely, I, you know, they're, they're definitely pricey if you buy them brand new. Yep. Um, but for me, just the, the, how quickly you can can with them is just amazing. Yeah, and they're definitely investments too. Like we look at a lot of things on the homestead, you know, that we – purchase, you know, how long is this going to last? Is it something that, you know, are we buying just for one season or is it something we're going to get multiple years out of? Yeah. And I think that's a, that's a big part of homesteading, at least to me, I, you know, I talk about the three S's self-sufficiency, self-reliance and sustainability. And to me, you know, there's different aspects of su sustainability, but I think as homesteaders, we do have um, a perspective with regards to the environment where we're wanting to care for it. We're not wanting to you know, just live in a throwaway society. We want things that are, are going to last. Um, and definitely when you buy an All-American canner, that is something that, um, it, it's, it's awesome to me when I see people that will go, go to a, a rummage sale or they'll go to a, a garage sale or an auction and they'll find an All-American canner from, you know, 1940, whatever. Uh, and, and it's just as good today as it was back then. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's definitely something that you, you, you guys will be able to use and, and pass on to, to Emma and, and 
if she doesn't want it, maybe on to your grandkids and who knows. Totally. That's, that's the plan. Not just for the canner, but for, you know, everything else that we're doing here. And that's one of the things I think you guys mentioned, um, you, you mentioned it um, in your um, video that we're going to get to here in a minute about your recent job change. And you mentioned how Emma has been a big part of why you got into homesteading and, and kind of what has um, caused you guys to, to do more and more. And, you know, to me, it's been awesome to see my son even though I'm not sure, I mean, he's 16 and right now he doesn't really want to, you know, he does stuff with us on the homestead, but I don't see him growing up to be a homesteader, at least in his early twenties or whatever, maybe he'll come back to it, but at least he's got that connection to understand where food comes from and what the value is of food. And I think that's a big part of it is that we're investing that into our kids. Yeah. I agree with you a hundred percent. Um, seeing Emma run around with the meat birds <laughs> is probably one of the, one of the best things, like just to witness that and be around for it. Yeah. It's, it's pretty darn cute. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, she's getting to experience a lot of things and, and grow up with, with things that, you know, a lot of, a lot of other kids aren't getting to experience. And, and I think that's, I think that's great again, because you're instilling in her where these, where, where the food comes from and, hopefully in that there'll be a respect for it that perhaps some others don't have. Yeah, that's our hope. You just did a video. She's two. So you're, you're dealing with, we're not going to call them the ter- We'll call them the toddler twos. Yeah. Yeah. Terrible would work, but we don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes. No, no, she's not that bad. <laughs> no. What, what is, you know, what are the, some of the things that she enjoys? You mentioned the meat birds. She loves the meat birds. I- yeah. I, I think, she loves the chickens she hated the pigs for a long time and then now seems to be very obsessed with them and she can say pig so it's pretty cute but i I think something that she really enjoys and it it may just be because she's mommy obsessed these days but and i love to garden so she's so sweet as soon as i'm in the garden she's right in there digging and she has her own little garden set and picking the weeds and she is she's pretty impressive she knows what a weed is because i've been trying to teach her yeah she's got a little garden like a little garden rake and a garden trowel that she goes out yeah. and plays with when mommy's gardening too we're trying to teach her you know picking like the yellow or red tomatoes not the green tomatoes um so that's been a lot of fun to just constantly teaching her you know not just abcs and one two threes but teaching her about the land and um, she's the only person I've ever met that can eat a green strawberry and not I fuck know. her right up. She, <laughs> she loves funny. green strawberries. Like she'll pick them off the plant and just eat them. That's funny. Wow. Wow. That's tart. Whew. Oh, very tart. <laughs> wow. So you, um, mentioned that you're doing pork shares. Um, so with your, uh, you know, with your pastured pork and you have six pigs right now, is this like um, a year round thing that you're doing or just doing during the summer or how do you handle that? So up until this point, we've just done feeders. Um, Last year was actually our first go of doing, doing it in the way that, that we've kind of evolved into doing it, which is, I mean, for lack of a better term, and and it's a term I've kind of seen tossed around uh, is forest pasturing where our, our land is, is not very conducive to raising animals on pasture, which you would traditionally think of pasture as, you know, grassy wide open areas. Um, Of the 10 and a half acres that we have, 10 acres of that is forested um, with with large timber. So for us, um, we looked at raising pigs in a way that we could utilize the land and, and essentially work to clear more land over time but also still provide a suitable habitat for the animals. So we run our pigs in the woods. Um, We use two strand electric to keep them in. And we expanded from three that we did last year to kind of test the proof of concept. We doubled it to six this year. And next year I'm thinking I'm gonna run as many as Jackie will let me. Her eyes are really wide right now. (laughs) Are you just finding this out, Jackie? I'm just finding out right now. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> That's like a whole homesteading journey for us. It's always been like, oh, hey, Jackie, what do you think about this? It's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission sometimes. That's kind of how it is here, too. 
he's lucky I'm a therapist and I I'm uh, pretty good at at being uh, chill for the most. Part. You you have good coping mechanisms. <laughs> what was that? You have good coping mechanisms. That's right. Using some buzzwords right there. I like it. <laughs> well, that's the only buzzwords I know. <laughs> Here in, in our homestead, that seems to be a kind of our way of doing it uh, too, where, um, I, you know, for example, last year I, I came home with six ducks um, and my wife was like, oh, did you, uh, you know, were they on sale? And I was like, uh, no, I ordered them. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that was coming from a guy who had swore that he would never, ever do ducks again. Uh, and then I came home with six of them and we still have ducks to this day. Um, but, uh, yeah, so a lot of times my wife finds out after the fact, and I'm very, very blessed that she is pretty, uh, pretty chill and pretty long suffering with me. Although there are a couple of animals that she's drawn the line in the sand and said, I can't get number one, our Guinea fowl. Yes. Number two are goats. Those are the two I can't get. I'm with her on the guineas because our neighbors had them and they are so obnoxious. Yes. <laughs> I, can't get on, I can't get on board. Yeah. No matter how, like. No matter how much somebody down like down up down plays or up plays, the ability of their of them to be guardians of your flock, I I can't get on board with having that screaming banshee in my backyard twenty four seven. Yeah, we, our neighbor had some, uh, and yeah, it was not good. And he started out with twelve, and uh, you know they they got picked off, and it wasn't by us. Although I had probably I think there were times <laughs> that I had to tell my wife not to go get, uh, get them, but. Uh, you know, eventually they, they went by the wayside one by one and they never got them again. And, um, but yeah, she's drawn a line in the sand. No guineas, no goats. Goats are a tough one for us because we've talked about the idea of goats, but we don't drink a lot of milk. And I don't know if we're ready to take the plunge into something where we would milk, you know, with a goat, there is a commitment of time to milk it morning and evening um, or at least mornings. For us, I mean, I think meat goats would be the only real way we would get into it. but at the same time, we don't necessarily need meat goats because we have pigs and we do a lot of our protein that way. So I'm with you on the goats. Now, what about with, with 10 acres, you'd be able to do some beef cows if you wanted. Is that something you thought about? If we were able to clear the land out and, and get some grass going, a cow is not something we've ruled out in the long term. Right. Um, but it would be multiple years of running pigs on an area, clearing it out, coming through, harvesting the timber, and then overseeding that land. And it's eventually augmenting the land to be able to, to support um, a very small cattle operation, you know, basically mm -hmm. personal for personal use. Yeah. Um, we are blessed locally in that we do have a few uh, very reputable cattle operations around where you know, if we're looking for beef, we can usually find what we want at a solid price. Um, and whether it's bartering or buying it outright, we can usually make something work. That, that, that's awesome. We're, we're blessed the, the same way here in our area um, with, with that as well. I, I, you know, someday I would love to, to, to raise some, some beef cows. I've looked at, you know, the smaller breeds just because I have a tendency to lean in that direction. Um, and, and the Dexters, the Highlands and, and um, American Milking Devons are kind of the ones that I just look at and, and um, covet so badly. But it, it's tough to do that on 2.16 acres. Yeah. <laughs> and we're not, as much as we like where we are now, we've kind of talked a little bit about, you know, a 10-year plan down the road. I mean, definitely not within five years. But there have been a few pieces of land that have come up for sale in the area that, you know, we've kind of looked at each other and said, not now, but something like that in the future. Yeah, I agree. Because I, I have always wanted, I, I like the idea of a cow. I love the idea of horses, not that they're going to provide us with food per se, but um, just I've always loved the bigger animals. Um, and this property doesn't really lend it to that at this time so we've always thought about moving on up if if it was in the cards in the future that's something that for me as well um you know again a little over two acres here and you know really i kind of feel like we're pushing the envelope as far as what we can do on this land um you know there just because of how it's laid out and and the makeup of the land itself 
you know, we're on what they call Bald Mountain. And the reason why it's called Bald Mountain is because they, they cut the top of it off uh, back in the late 1800s as a limestone quarry. And there's just a lot of shale, a lot of limestone. It's, it's um, definitely not condu, you know, our, our wooded area and where we run our pigs is really got a lot of rock and, and, and whatnot in it. So it's not really conducive to doing much else besides putting pigs or goats or something like that on it. Um, and so, you know, kind of my dream at, at times has been if I could ever find that right place to kind of make that next step, it'd be beautiful. But then I also think along with bigger land comes bigger commitments and yeah. bigger headaches and <laughs> there's only so many hours in the day. Exactly. I'm thinking I, I have a hard time, hard enough time trying to keep up with what I've got going on here um, because I work a, a full time off farm job. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it, uh, you know, it, it's tough enough to keep up with what we've got going on, let alone if I were to try to, to step it up any. Yeah, I think it's the same with us here. We're both working full-time jobs and, you know, Jack's previous job, he was around here a lot more because uh, he worked from the home, but, and that, I think that helped us at times, but then there was also the downtimes when he would travel, but it's, I think we have a delicate balance right now between meat chickens, egg layers, six pigs, two dogs, a cat, and a toddler. I think we're balancing it just fine enough, and then, of course, Yes, if you upgrade, it, it presents a whole new host of challenges. Yeah. The job change I made would not have been conducive to going to an even bigger piece. No, of no, it wouldn't have. And that really leads us to that. That's kind of been the biggest step, I guess we would say, lately in your journey has been a career change. I would say, yeah, that was kind of the biggest, uh, that's been the biggest shakeup, if you will. I mean, more so than any animal that's come onto the farm that's required new fencing or shelter or feeders and waters i mean the the biggest change has been that yeah the only change. thing new we had was ducks and they've been pretty easy so. yeah ducks are <laughs> ducks are like dirty chickens uh exactly stinky dirty chickens <laughs> yep and and so you, you, this change really i don't want to put words in your mouth but my takeaway from your video is it really was directly tied to your desire to be more at home and homesteading kind of thing. It was kind of driven by the homestead lifestyle. Yeah, I guess I'm trying to find the words to kind of put together what what it was all about. So to, I guess to give the, the listeners kind of a background, if you haven't seen our YouTube channel or anything like that, uh, my previous job, I was a salesman for a company that provided uh, workwear for arborists, loggers, virtually anybody who worked in the green industry, landscapers, uh, tree guys, things like that. Uh, and we provided uniforms and personal protective equipment like chainsaw chaps, uh, chainsaw pants, things like that to those customers. Uh, my personal territory was from Niagara Falls, New York, up to Caribou, Maine, up by the Canadian border, and down to Cape May, New Jersey, uh, which is the southern tip. So I was traveling approximately 40,000 miles a year by vehicle uh, to, to fulfill my obligations to the company. Um, and I love them. You know, it was one of those things where it was actually very bittersweet to kind of make the move uh, that I did. But I really wanted to have a job where I wasn't leaving the farm in Jackie's hands. Not that she's incompetent, but, you know, it presented a whole bunch of stress for her, especially after having a kid. If she had to manage pigs, chickens, ducks, Emma, dogs, cats and the garden for and herself a, and herself for a stretch of three or four days at a time. I, I totally 100% um, get where you're coming from because prior to the position that I have now, the job that I have now, I was working for a company that I absolutely loved, but uh, I was gone on average a week, a month. Uh, and sometimes it would, you know, it would come in a spurt where there was one time and it happened to be during hunting season um, where from opening day to the last day of hunting season, I was literally gone every other week. And uh, it was such that I couldn't come back and say to my wife, well, hey, I'm heading to the woods to go hunting. So I didn't hunt that season. Um, but when, you, when you're doing things like that and you're traveling that much, um, it definitely does put stress on your, on your family, on your, on your spouse or your significant other. 
in our our case, we actually it was the first time I ever tried doing pastured poultry, and it was a train wreck. Um, I, I built these hoop coops, and I thought, oh, two by fours on the bottom, that's a bad idea. I want to go with two by sixes, but let me go pressure treated two by sixes. Mm -hmm. And uh, so these things were heavier than a dead preacher. I could barely move them, and then I'd be gone for a week. My wife couldn't move them. And so those chickens just killed my yard. My yard's never really recovered um, as a result, but we would never be able to do the, the stuff that we're doing today if I still had my old job. Yeah, I think, you know, from my view of Jack, I think it was, it kind of ties into us, you know, the mindful homestead. It was this really mindful choice of, you know, really stepping back and getting this bigger picture of what we wanted our life to be like. And, and that position that he was in didn't lend itself to, to that. And, and just the, the stresses that come along with travel, like you said, you know, he sometimes was gone for weeks and, and um, I was more than capable of taking care of the farm. But of course, we also live in New Hampshire, and we live in an area where it loses power a lot. So it's also these I think, you know, you can manage it and you can do it, but I think it's the mindfulness of, yes, I can do it, but what about the unexpected things? And I think that that's when it's nice to have your partner home uh, because really I think homesteading in a marriage is a partnership. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a huge piece of it as well is, is not having your teammate, I think is, is really challenging. And I think to bring positive out of what's been going on since March at this point with the COVID, you know, pandemic that's going on. Um, Jackie was working from home. She was able to see her clients via telehealth and I was working from home. My company was very proactive in, you know, shutting us down and saying, Hey, sales guys, you know, you're not going out on the road. Don't go see people. You're working from home. Um, it really brought to light kind of being able to spend time with my family and work from home and have that more flexible schedule you know, to the end that, you know, in the last few months, my company has started saying, okay, when we get back on the road, you know, I, I had a great manager and, and Lance, if you're listening to this, you might see it on my Facebook. Um, I'm sure I'm going to share a link to this. Lance, I love you. But, uh, but my manager said to me one day, he said, you know, you've got this farm going and you've got all these animals and, you know, you've got Jackie there, but what is she going to do? And what are you going to do? when you get back on the road because the expectation was kind of creeping in that once we did get back on the road and had to make up ground they were looking for three weeks out of the month that they really wanted us on the road um and i at the time i played it off and i said well i've got a pig feeder that'll hold 600 pounds of feed and you know the chickens can go three or four days with their feeders filled and their waters filled and you know the meat birds they're a little tough but we can figure something out there and you know, I, I kind of played it off at that point, but in my head I was thinking, you know, oh man, I really, I don't want to get back on the road. I don't want to be, you know, away from home overnight, worrying about the animals, worrying about the stress that, that Jackie has to take care of everything while I'm gone. Again, not that she can't, she's totally capable, but if we're coming at it from a, a team standpoint, you know, I, it's not just about the money at that point. It's how much effort are you putting into moving the family unit together forward? And I think the family unit, I think, is really a key part um, because, you know, as we've talked about before, you know, already Emma plays a huge part in why you're doing this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you're on, if you're on the road three weeks out of the month, th those are days that you can't get back with her. Yeah. And it, and it plays back to days I remember as a teenager where, you know, my, my father was in sales. He was in the mortgage business growing up. And I remember, you know, dinner time, the, the phone would ring and he would have to get up and pick it up. And, you know, at the time, I just remember being this angsty teenager, like, oh man, that, that sucks. I hate that my dad is, you know, he, and I know that's not true now, but at the time it was like, man, he cares more about that than us. And, you know, I know that's not true as a father, um, but I caught myself doing the same thing where if my cell phone rang at 7.30 at night and we were eating dinner, I had to pick it up because that was a sales, it was probably a sales call and it was money that I could be losing if I didn't pick it up. 
I, I caught myself just doing little things like that and it didn't jive into the vision that I, I had for, for us as a family unit. And, you know, Emma's two years old at this point. She's not old enough to realize dad is picking up the phone at dinner time and going to make, make a phone call. But I didn't want to let it get to that point. And, and you know, the funny thing is my, my, my dad was um, a, a pastor and a missionary uh, as I was growing up. And I remember at times feeling kind of that same sense of resentment that, you know, there were times when I felt like my dad was um, more interested in other people's kids than he was in his own. Uh, and, and as a, as a father now, and understanding what my dad was doing at the time, um, my perspective of my father has completely changed. Um, uh, you know, but, but as a kid, you, you, that's your perspective. Um, and, and you certainly don't want your, your, your child growing up with resentment towards you as a, as a father. Um, but, um, you know, even towards it, the, the possibility that could even creep in towards being resentful, resentful towards uh, homesteading, you know, and, and so forth. Um, I, I really applaud you guys for, for making uh, the decision that you did to, uh, to try to do what was best for, for your family, um, for your family unit. It feels good to have somebody else say, you know, that it was a good choice because it's definitely, for me at least, you know, there is such a, there's such a stereotype in society, I guess, where, you know, somebody's got to go out and, you know, be the breadwinner and, and really you know, you have to climb that corporate ladder and keep climbing up. And, you know, it, I think at least from my standpoint, we're lucky enough where, you know, Jackie's business and her clients, they're able to, to bring the majority of the money and she loves her work. For me to kind of squander in a position where I wasn't truly happy just for the sake of saying I was able to climb that ladder. For what? Yeah, for what? Exactly. Um, you know, that's what it came down to. And I, and I think a lot of it comes back to understanding what your priorities are as an individual and as a family. Um, and, you know, you're, you're absolutely spot on that in our day and age and in our culture, it's, it's all about getting a, a better paying job so you can get a bigger house so that you can, you know, and then you've got to have a better paying job to pay for the bigger house. And then you got, you know, and, and, and all of those things that people kind of chase after. And unfortunately it, from my perspective, trying not to be too judgmental here, <laughs> but uh, I think a lot of times people end up losing sight of really what's important. Mm -hmm. And at least for me, family um, is important. You know, the food that I eat and raise is important. And I would much rather focus my energy on that. And, and, and we have made, you know, decisions as a family. My wife um, has pretty much been a stay at home mom since the time that our son was born. And that was a decision that we made. And, you know, there's been a financial impact as a result of that. We wouldn't, we wouldn't trade that, but that was a decision that we made because we felt that that's what was right for us. And so I always, I, I love to see people who are, are willing to, to take those steps because I'm sure it wasn't easy for you to, to make that decision uh, from the standpoint of, you know, you've got a, a career with a, a nice paycheck coming in. And, and to kind of step out, step out of that is there, there's got to be a bit of a fear to that. Yeah, I think, I think we both as a couple had, had a lot of fear. However, it was something that we talked about for years, kind of. I mean, it was a really, really, really well thought out, mindful choice that we made. And, and you know, we knew that we wanted to make that transition. However, we wanted to make it at the best time for us as a family. But I think whenever you make a big life change, you know, worry is right there on your shoulder. Um, of course it is. I mean, why wouldn't it be, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and then it is important to clarify, like, you know, I didn't just up and quit my job, like, you know, say that's it, I'm done, I got to get out of it. Um, I had actually, so the, the farm store I'm working at now, I had actually applied there last year. And at that point, Jackie's practice was just kind of getting up off the ground. She didn't have a full caseload yet. And I was offered a position, but the, mo the money wasn't there at the time. Um, Jackie's business wasn't thriving like it is now. And, and, and I had to say no, and that was very tough. Um, 
to kind of put my tail between my legs and say, all right, I've got to go back to the sales thing. And, um, but it ends up those sort of things work out. I mean, I was actually approached by the manager of the store, uh, about a month and a half ago. And, and that's where the whole thing kind of started again, where he simply said, he remembered that interview and he said, are you still looking for a job? And my response was, you know, without giving too much away, you know, in my head, I was like, yes, please, please give me a job. I'm so dying to get out. But my response was just kind of like, yeah, you know, I, I could talk about a job. And, uh, and it ended up working out, which, which was great. Um, and I guess it was all just kind of, it was rooted in place when I called my manager to give my resignation. Um, you know, his words were, you know, one, I, I knew this was coming. And two, I applaud you for staying true to yourself. Uh, because he'd been in the sales industry for years and he had seen people burn out and he'd seen people, you know, essentially lose their minds in a sales position that they didn't want to do. And they were lured in by the thought of, you know, fancy cars and big houses and things like that. I mean, don't get me wrong. Those things are nice. We're, we're talking and we're on a zoom conference with a MacBook pro that I used to edit the videos for the YouTube channel, but it, it's not those things that are making you happy. It's the things I'm able to do with those, with nice things. Sometimes, you know, they're, there's something extra. They're not, they're not what I'm all about. We're all about. Uh, that that's great. That's great. And you know, one of the things that I really appreciated about that vi that video when when you shared on on your channel about you um, changing careers is that you really did focus on the fact that this wasn't something you know that you were kind of just hacked off and you know told your boss off and walked off in a huff and quit. Um, but there was a plan uh, that you had in place to you know to kind of make this transition. And, you know, one of the things that I sometimes see people do with regards to homesteading is they, they look at the lifestyle and they're like, okay, we're going to quit our jobs. We're going to go buy this piece of property. We're going to live off the land. And that's just not realistic. Not at all. No. I, I think you even mentioned in your, in your video that, you know, you, it takes money to do this. There, there are certain people, I, I guess, periodically I'll see in some of the groups um, you know, people that look down on those of us who still work, you know, off the homestead or off the farm and, uh, you know, as if we're not doing it right. Uh, and I guess each one of us have to make our, our you know, the, take the path that we feel is right for our families. Um, but certainly if, if you're thinking about quitting your job uh, to homestead, make sure you've got a good plan in place <laughs> because <laughs> it's not cheap. Yeah, and even more so if your plan is to become a homestead YouTuber, because that is not as as uh, lucrative as as many would have you believe either. Kind of switching over to that, you guys have been doing the YouTube thing now for what uh, two years? It's about a year. Yeah, a year and eight months. I it think was January will be two years. It was yeah, it was January of 2019, I believe, when we started the YouTube channel, which originally just kind of started as a, again a way to show our friends and family who live out of state what we were doing. Like, what do you mean you're getting chickens? What do you mean you're going to start raising pigs? Uh, you know, are you going to start chewing on straw and, you know, cutting the cord and going off grid too? Like, what's up? Um, we just wanted to, to be able to put out there, you know, show our friends and family, hey, this is what we're doing. You know, once in a while, we'll put a video out talking about, you know, our, our pigs. And I think that's been pretty cool for people to be able to see where their food is coming from. Um, one of the things that we do is we work with a great local butcher who comes to our place and processes our pigs on site, um, or at least the, the, the slaughtering through having them on site. Uh, he has an offsite meat locker where he does the actual the cutting. But everyone we talk to, and not everyone's taken us up on it, but anyone that buys a share of our pork is able to come out for, for slaughter day where you know, they can see the, the work that goes into their food. Um, not everyone has taken us up on that yet, which is <laughs> totally acceptable. Most have not. But what the YouTube channel has kind of morphed into is a way where not only our customers, but anybody else who wants to can see the work that goes into to raising food. Because, you know, it's not, a chicken should not be raised in a cage in a warehouse, you know, and then cut and put into cellophane wrapping and then put out in your butcher cooler at the grocery store. 
same thing with a pig. Like a pig should not be raised in a warehouse on a concrete floor where the only relationship you have with that animal is what it looked like in that little styrofoam tray before you toss it on your barbecue. Um, we always just kind of wanted to, to give people a look into what it takes to raise an animal ethically as, as we kind of, to raise an animal mindfully, to wrap it up with the name of the, mm -hmm. of the whole shebang um, and to give people the ability to see that. Yeah, and I think that's huge. I think it's great that people do have that connection because even, you know, some people either they don't have the um they don't have the 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 land to be able to raise the animal, they don't have the, you know, the know-how, they maybe physically not able to whatever. They they're just people that can't do it. Um but they can be connected to their food and understand, you know, the blood, sweat and tears that has gone in to, to raising that animal. And, and I'm convinced that that helps people vet, not, not to the same level that doing it yourself does. I don't think anything can replace that, but the more we can get people to value it, um, I think the better because we, we've just, we've so cheapened what food is. Um, I think it's just sad. Yeah, I think that's another really valuable piece of getting into this whole journey with homesteading. And, and this is me being a geeky psychotherapist, but to watch people that we know, watch us do these things and watch their emotions. How can you do that? How can you raise that animal and then kill it? And to, I think that's the additional piece of the education is helping under, people understand and then to watch their emotional you know, temperature change about that, I think is also really fascinating. And it's just that understanding piece that I think is, is huge. And I, I, for me personally, is very meaningful because as a psychotherapist, I enjoy teaching people about their emotions and their brain and how that functions and for them to be able to understand that better. And then to be able to pull that into what I do outside of the office is, is pretty cool. And, and overall to just watch that in people and, and just, to have, have people have that understanding. Yeah, as a homesteading and farming operation, like we are small and we're always going to remain small. And, you know, we have no visions of grandeur that we're going to feed, you know, hundreds of people ever. You know, if, if we feed 10 people a year, that that's an accomplishment for us. But if we're putting out these videos and it gives one person the ability to make that switch from buying their meat at the grocery store to heading to their local farmer's market and, and picking up some pasture raised pork or picking up some pasture chickens, you know, that, that's all the reward that, that I would like, that I'd love to see out of it. I mean, that's that right there, even if they're not buying from us, if it gives someone the ability or the, the kind of chutzpah to go buy from their local farmer, that's a win as far as I'm concerned. Absolutely. Absolutely. 100%. Uh, again, it just, it comes back to, you know, as you were saying, Jackie, how people will have that perspective of how, you know, how can you, how can you raise an animal and then kill it? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, I've always said, number one, if it never, if I ever get to the spot to where, I don't want to say it doesn't bother me, but that, you know, that I, I don't take it seriously, then mm -hmm. to me, that's the time I've got to get rid of my animals. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because, they, you know, I take no pleasure in it. But again, it's just, and, and, and it's very interesting to me, your perspective um, as a therapist and, and kind of how you connect the dots. But for me, just when I, when I have raised that animal and then I take the life of that animal, I value that so much more than anything that I would trade dollars for. Um, there's just, there's a value that I place on that. And so you know, I, I look at it from the standpoint, you're less likely to waste it. You know, you're going to treat it with respect. You're going to um, try to use every part of the animal that you can because you don't, you know, you want to value and appreciate that. And, you know, while I get where people come from, from the standpoint of how can you raise it and then kill it, at the end of the day, if you're going to eat meat, somebody raised it and somebody killed it. That's right. So if I can give it a better job, I mean, a better life, and it only has one bad day, that's my goal. Yeah. And that's what I said, even this year with this batch of pigs, um, it was pretty stressful in the beginning because they weren't what we wanted them to be. And they, 
they were a little weak and stressed out at the beginning and we were stressed out of like, oh my gosh, are these pigs going to survive? And this is really, this is our second year and this is crazy and what's going to happen? And we had a lot of worry, but I remember, you know, at a quiet moment saying to Jack, like, you know what? These pigs were probably going to be the the pigs in the uh, concrete floor factories. And you know what? These six pigs are going to have the best life that they would have ever had. And I'm so happy that they get to live that here. And, and the day that they're gone is the day that they're gone, but they have lived the best life that they would have ever lived. And I think that that is where it stops for me is that I hate slaughter day. I hate when we have to you know, get rid of a chicken because it's sick. All of those things are horrible. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, that animal lived such a better life than it would have ever lived in, you know, a high production farm. And even in the, in the moments when you have to call an animal, you feel like it it sucks. You're trying to do right by that animal. That's right. And, uh, and so you take, you know, solace again in, in the fact that it, you know, it lived a great life. You tried to give it as, as good of a life as you could. Um, and, and, you know, that's the best we can do as homesteaders. My wife will help when we do meat birds. Um, because when it comes to meat birds, you know, almost butcher day is almost a mercy killing. <laughs> yes, <it is. laughs> uh, but when, when it's time to process the hens, my wife doesn't want to be anywhere near, near, nearby. I think that I have not gotten to the point of being around for processing. I can be around when they look like they're coming from the grocery store. So they're defeathered or if it's the pigs, if the, the heads are gone and things like that, it looks like it's hanging in a meat cooler. I can get, I can get on board at that point, but um, I'm not at that point yet. So I give your wife a lot of credit. Even at la- even last year we did uh So we did one pig last year as a workshop where people were able to come out and kind of view the process from start to finish. But, uh, but our, our butcher friend, and I say butcher friend, he is our butcher, but he's also a friend of ours. He came out the following weekend and I kind of helped him do the last two. And Jackie at one point to her credit walked outside while the pig was hanging off the tractor. And it was, I think we had skipped, we had taken the trotters off, taken the head off and skinned it, but we hadn't halved it yet. Yeah, but it looked like it was hanging in a exactly. meat cooler. <laughs> yeah, it, it was a pig in a meat cooler. And to her credit, she came out and, and hung with us through the gutting process and everything else. And it was, I think, a big step for you. In Yeah, and I looked at it as I was looking at it at, as educational at that point. Like I got to ask Dan a lot of questions and learn about the different parts of the animal, which I think brought more mindfulness and more appreciation. Yeah, you ate pig tongue tacos after that. I did, believe it or not. Awesome. They were good. good. That's right. From nose to tail, right? That's our goal. So pig tongue tacos. Absolutely. Everything. That's right. As they say, everything but the squeal. Yep. And I'm a little bit of a pot stirrer, I guess you could call. During that during that processing last year, I posted a picture on Instagram and very much to what you were saying earlier about the day that you can't, you know, process that you're eating, you know, an animal you shouldn't eat meat. Um, during the processing workshop that we ran, uh, when we took the head off, off the animal, it ended up in a snowbank. And I took a picture of the head in a snowbank, which I felt was very poignant in my, uh, I guess, in my self-awareness or awareness of, of where meat comes from. Um, and it offended a lot of people on Instagram. Um, it didn't get pulled, which was kind of surprising. But I think Jackie had to rope me in a little bit after I posted it because a lot of people got upset. And, you know, I, my first instinct was to kind of lash out back and be like, listen, you eat meat. This is the reality of it. Um, If you can't accept this, you really shouldn't eat meat. But you had kind of explained it in a way that not everyone has made that switch yet. Yeah, I don't remember what profound thing I said, but I do remember trying to give you perspective. <laughs> I do remember that picture, actually. I, 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 I can picture it in my mind. Uh, I think a lot I, of people remember that picture. <laughs> I, I do. I, I remember that. I remember the, uh, I remember the, um, some of the responses as well. And, and, it's, and it is sad to me that, you know, I see this in a number of homesteading groups, um, uh, you know, on Facebook and whatnot, the amount of vitriol that I see um from people 
uh, with regards to those of us who, you know, harvest animals. Um, mm -hmm. and, and to me, it's, it's shocking that, you know, to see that in, in homesteading groups, because I, I would, I would kind of figure that people would understand that that's a part of homesteading, even if you choose not to do it. And I understand people who are, who are vegan and, and, and vegetarian and, and who, and some of the, the, the reasons why they choose not to do it. I have no problem with that, but uh, for, for many people, it's a huge part of homesteading. And so when, when people go off the rails like that, it, a lot of times I, I can understand why you responded the way you did. <laughs> and the, and the, the wild part about it too, was I got more, I got more positive feedback from a few friends that were actually vegetarians yeah, and did. vegans. Um, I had a, a meaningful discussion with a friend from high school who's vegan and she runs an animal rescue uh, down in, I believe it's Pennsylvania now where they live. And she runs an animal rescue, which is a no kill where people can drop off their farm animals. And she has alpacas and sheep and some goats and chickens and ducks and things like that. And, you know, at first her response was very kind of, visceral like how can you do this but then i explained to her that you know i eat meat and this is i'm if i'm going to eat meat i feel that this is how people should eat meat they should recognize that it is an animal and that it gave its life for your food and she came back and she and, you know to her credit she actually said i respect what you do i don't agree with it but you are leaps and bounds. you are not my enemy in the fight that i lead against the meat industry you know, you are a panacea, if you will. You know, you are not the person that is is furthering the issues that we've run into. Yeah, and I and I appreciate when people who have you know a different perspective can can be like that. You know, again, it's uh, it's a huge part of homesteading, um, and I understand people that are outside of it might view view what we do with a. Uh, I, I guess a, a bit of a, a, a different perspective. Um, but it, it still shocks me every time I see things like that blow up in a homesteading group. And, and then, especially if it's on your own homestead Instagram page that, that people lose their minds like that still just blows my mind. But I, I you know, I, I don't want to get off into the culture in which we live. We'll, we'll try to avoid that topic for today. Yeah, we, don't, we don't want PETA protesting your podcast. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, but it is, it is hard to not take things that impact you personally to heart, right? I mean, I think that is hard. And I think it's part of the homesteading journey. It is a reality that when you put these things out there, it, it's kind of the, the side you were talking about before where you don't see all the poop and the smelliness. And it, it is part of the journey. And, and I, I don't think it's, I tripped, it's bad the, to acknowledge. I tripped in the pig pen this afternoon. Yes, you did. You went down. Jackie was on the phone inside <laughs> talking to a friend and I was walking through the pig pen from the woods out back and I tripped and landed right in some pig poop and I started <laughs> screaming and yelling and get off the phone. Come help me. The, the pigs were essentially what happened was the pigs had knocked down the electric wire in front of the hog panels and they had started pushing a hog panel up and I needed to get the electric fixed. But as anyone who's raised pigs before, if the, the moment you kind of kneel down to work on an electric fence, you're going to have six pigs kind of nosing you with their muddy noses. And, yep. and I needed some help in kind of fending them off while I fixed the fence. So Pig uh, kisses. They stink. Kisses. Yeah, I, I uttered some choice words at Jackie <laughs> from across the yard. It was... Uh, that's and in all my therapist glory, I said, honey, I can't read your mind. If you need help, you got to ask for yep. it. <laughs> But again, but to your point, I didn't bust out the camera. I didn't start recording. You know, it will never make it into a YouTube video that I was up to the thigh and pig poop <laughs> on my jeans. Yeah, and, and, that's, and that's why I think, um, you know, people have, sometimes people end up with a perspective of homesteading that um, maybe is, is a bit rom more romantic than what it really is. And so then when they see a picture of a head in a snowbank, maybe that is is the shocker for them. Well, thank you guys. I, man, we have gone like forever and I feel like I could keep chatting with you guys forever and then the podcast would be four hours long. Um, 
what are your kind of your future plans for your homestead? Well, we're raising more pigs. <laughs> yeah, that's a definite. We're gonna you just found that out. Yeah. Yep. That was I. I Jackie not saying no at this point is the green light apparently to get more pigs next year. Yeah, as long as they're not near the house. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about smelly. Um, I don't. I don't know. What What is our plan? I think we'd like to expand the garden. Um, we're currently kind of working on a loose plan to build a food forest. Um, we have a small raised bed garden in the back, which is able to provide through the summertime and, and um, really a little bit into the canning side of things. But I think we want to expand that into the, the front yard um, where we're running the meat birds right now. We eventually want to plant some fruit trees and start a small orchard. We have a couple peach trees. We have a bunch of blueberry bushes, but we want to kind of expand our, our food production beyond just the meat and the gardening that we do now into more of a you know year round type thing. Um, we're still going to keep slowly chunking away, clearing some land, using the pigs to help us out. Yep. Yeah, I guess in the spring we'll, our chickens are currently in our backyard. So once the pigs are gone and the snow melts, um, we're going to move the chickens back where the pigs were and let them kind of scratch it out and flatten the land and then hopefully have it be usable land and, you know, keep, keep reclaiming some of the wooded parts of our, of our homestead. Yeah, it's all just small, small steps working, you know, eventually toward a more workable piece of land. Um, you know, it, it, we're not necessarily looking to get bulldozers in here and start topping over, toppling over trees and things like that. We're just kind of doing what we can and taking small bites. And, you know, using animals to do the, uh, you know, to do the work is, um, you know, it's a win-win um, because yeah. you're, you're going to, eventually have more usable land, but then you also have food to put in the freezer. And, uh, and so it just is, is really a, a great approach. You know, a lot of times going back to the whole goats, the, you know, they say that the best way to clear land is to run through goats because they'll eat the high stuff, then run through pigs, they'll eat the low stuff and then bring through the chickens and they'll spread it all out. So maybe you do need to make the leap to goats. <laughs> yeah, and not to hype the channel too much, but we do have a video uh, we did a collaboration with the Green Dream Project. They had their Green Stetter Summit this year. Uh, we did a video on kind of our permaculture plans going forward. Uh, it's on their channel right now. It is going to be on our channel in another couple weeks. Um, so if you want to know more about kind of where we're going in the future of our uh, homestead, that that's a great video that kind of outlines how we're doing what we're doing and the long-term progression of it. And definitely, I'll make sure that I put links to your uh, YouTube channel, to your website uh, in the show notes. And uh, definitely, you're going to want to check them out. Um, you're kind of getting a reputation for your tractor videos. Tractor videos are quite popular, as it turns out. Yeah, so that, that's awesome. Although you and I have kind of gone back and forth a little bit that you've got the wrong color orange, but I'll forgive you. So uh, it's, You know what? It's okay. They both begin with K. Uh, <laughs> and it, it's, it's, it's been a lot of fun to watch those videos as well. And, and that was definitely uh, one of the tractors that I had, I had looked at um, n nothing wrong with it whatsoever. Um, but always a lot of fun to just kind of tease back and forth, but uh, the tractor videos have definitely been very popular. Um, but uh, definitely check out the YouTube channel. You're not going to be disappointed. I really, really enjoy it. And uh, it's, it's been fun to watch you grow. Uh, in your channel and kind of the, the way that you put your, your videos together. I um, did the YouTube thing for a little bit and uh, realized that um, I did not enjoy it. And so I, I am more than happy to, uh, to support people that enjoy it and do a good job at it. And uh, so folks check out their YouTube channel and uh, their website. And also you want to check out that t-shirt that we were talking about. Um, it just cracks me up. I absolutely love it. I need to buy one myself because I think it's just, it's, it's awesome. But uh, and there's links to everything. If you go to a YouTube video or if you go to our Facebook, Instagram, there's, there's links to all of our social media, kind of every crosses, crosses over. So like, follow, whatever, whatever the platform um, requires. They, they all have different terminology now, but uh, definitely check them out. You're not going to be disappointed. Thank you guys so much for uh, joining me here on the podcast. Um, I really, really have enjoyed it and time has just flown by. Um, as we kind of wrap up, is there anything else that you, any words of wisdom, mindful words of wisdom that you'd like to leave with us? Jackie? 
who, yeah, I, I mean, I think if you're into homesteading, getting into homesteading, I think it's breaking it down into parts and being mindful of what you can do on your land and, and starting from there. And I think over time, you never know where that journey is going to take you. And we're not experts, but if you have any questions for us, we'd be happy to stumble through them with you. Excellent. Thanks again, guys. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. Well, folks, I hope you enjoyed that interview with Jack and Jackie. I really, really enjoyed chatting with them, and I could have kept chatting with them for a lot longer, but uh, then the podcast would have been even that much longer. So anyhow, uh, just really enjoyed chatting with them. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Links to their accounts, their social media accounts uh, are in the show notes, as well as links to our social media accounts as well. If you have any feedback, I can be reached at brian at the homesteadjourney.net. Or you can reach out to me on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, etc. As always, the music on this episode is provided by Audionautics.com. A big shout out to them. And until next time, everybody, keep up the good work.